And they, they tried to decentralize power, but then behind the scenes, they then created ethnic parties, which they, the Tigrayans then ran because they didn't fancy what they'd actually agreed to. So you can see, yes, there is the idea of, of ethnicity, ethnic federalism, but really it was, it was still controlled from the center. The continent of Africa has long been beset by military conflict and ethnic division. How do we as ordinary Africans go about securing a more prosperous and stable future for the continent? Well, somebody who's been spending his entire career dealing with the developments in Africa is Martin Plout. He is a veteran journalist, former BBC broadcaster, as well as a senior research fellow at the University of London. Martin Plout, welcome to Solutions with David Ansar. It's a pleasure to be with you. So Martin, you've been covering the African continent for many years now as a journalist. And what really has struck me the last, uh, I guess, 18 months or so is the rise in coups d'etat, uh, military takeovers of sometimes democratic, sometimes less democratic governments. Uh, what is causing this uptick in military intervention? I think there are many reasons uh, for it. There is no single uh, cause for uh, for this, uh, because you know every single country is as complicated as any other. Uh, I mean, some of them are tiny states. Of course, they're much simpler. But you know, the majority of states in in Africa are substantial, large, and have complicated histories. So, trying to find one thread through all of it is a bit like trying to uh, you know sort of unpick the the uh, sociology or the politics of South Africa. And you know, what's true in KwaZulu is not true in the Cape. So, you know, and that's just in one country. So you can imagine it can get very complicated, but there are some underlying themes, obviously. Um, I mean, the COVID um, pandemic has caused terrible disruption to people, the ongoing problems of uh, the impossibility of escaping from a, a lot of the, the, uh, the, the situations in particularly sub-Saharan Africa are a real problem because you know the, the route across the Mediterranean for for people to to uh, escape from is now effectively blocked uh, because of uh, the, what the European Union has done and then there are the the, the going ongoing problems of uh, you know frankly overpopulation and um, you know poverty you know when you have uh, vast numbers of young kids who are relatively well educated and have no way of making a living, it's not a, that's, you're not going to get stability. All right. So, Martin, earlier this year, we saw a successful coup in Burkina Faso, uh, a failed um, uh, coup in Guinea Bissau. Um, but then also previously, there were uh, two such incidents in, in Mali. Um, so, you know, I think perhaps this suggests something also about those citizens and their attitude towards, uh, towards democracy, um, particularly. In the Malian case, uh, you know, there's been about six months of protests there uh, against the, the government, and many people seem to be actually welcoming the military intervention, um, just because of the broader insecurity there, uh, you know, which has characterized the, the broader Sahel region. Um, so what, what do you think that suggests? Well, you're absolutely right. And uh, the, the problem is that there, there tends to be a sort of honeymoon period when uh, coups take place. You know, I remember being in one in Liberia, and uh, it was one of several that that happened. And when when they happen, people are delighted because uh, there's a bit of looting you can get on into, and you know the you think that the the person you uh, who is oppressing you, you've got rid of him, and you've got somebody else in. And there's a slight shift in in the in the patronage system that that exists in the country. Uh, but pretty soon, people discover that nothing much has happened. And uh, the, you know, go back to square one. I mean, you know, the, the problem is that, that you get vast differences in, 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 in Africa. I mean, let's just take two neighbors that are, are pretty close. Nigeria, uh, which has a, you know, massive country, very complicated north-south splits, uh, ethnic splits, differentiations over, over language and differentiations over religion, but still, you know, a, a vibrant democracy in many ways. And just, you know, to its south, you have Equatorial Guinea, which has been run since 
1979, I think it is, by the uh, uh, Nguema family, Obiang Nguema, uh, and then Teodor Nguema. And I mean, you know, the, this is just a, 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 a mini place, one and a half million people who has been captured by a family and they run it for their own benefit. And everyone else is frankly a slave. I mean, it has a slave history going back to the European period, but I mean, these people are actually enslaved by their own government. And the, the son, uh, you know, is a playboy. The Americans took huge quantities of money off and I think it was a speedboat, a yacht, you know, uh, everything you can possibly imagine. These people are held captive by the government. It is not a government. This is a gangsterism that is, that is okay. You take someone like Burkina Faso. Uh, I mean, they have, you know, struggled with different forms of, of democracy. And you had Sankara, who was seen as a very good guy, but then he was assassinated. And you go through all these, you know, changes of power, but does very much change for, for ordinary people? Probably not. And that is, that is terribly, terribly sad. Um, so, you know, in, in, in every, uh, in every place you have slightly different configurations, but essentially you have the, uh, a small group of people at the top who hold on to the power and the people at the bottom just don't have it. Yeah, so uh, I suppose uh, one of the contextual factors is the geopolitics and the regional dynamics as well. Uh, so we've seen the Ghanaian president uh, coming out and, and saying that uh, these coups are a threat to the West African region and stability there and the re regional bloc ECOWAS uh, seems to be rather helpless in, you know, maybe there might be some rhetorical condemnation, but uh, there's no real force behind that. Um, I'm a bit skeptical of some of these uh, regional uh, kind of institutional arrangements. What is your view on, on their uh, potential to kind of sway things either way? Well, sometimes they can be useful. I mean, there have been uh, during the, the terrible, um, Liberian situation, which on when you remember with Charles Taylor went on for years with huge effort and with um, a lot of assistance from from the Americans, uh, they did eventually you know solve that. You know he was forced into exile and is now imprisoned for what he was doing, um, and that is uh, you know that was a success. But they're few and far between, um, and you know the the real problem is that there's too much to be gained by by worrying about your own situation, that to really invest too much in what's going on in, in your neighbors. And some of them are really in, insuperable. I mean, you, you take like a, a place like Guinea-Bissau, which was, you know, has been really just turned into a narco state, which is run uh, for the Colombian cartels. Uh, I mean, the, the head of the Navy was arrested on board a yacht with a ton of cocaine. <laughs> I mean, you don't need to know too much about the country and the current president, uh, you know, against whom there's also been uh, apparently an attempted coup, but people say it wasn't really a coup. It was, uh, it, he actually staged it to, uh, to get more sympathy and more support. So, I mean, you know, what, what can you say about a, a, a country that, like that where, where the, the real powers are actually in Latin America and, and it's the money that talks and not the, it has nothing to do with, 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 with really what's going on on the ground. And you know, if, if anyone tries to block the, the, uh, you know, the Colombian co cocaine traffickers, you can imagine what happens to them. And what about the role of former colonial powers? I'm thinking particularly of France. Um, seems to be a tilt away uh, from that reliance on French military power, which has been pretty pervasive um, throughout the, the, the Sahel region. Um, and I think it was in Mali recently where the French ambassador was was uh, ordered to leave. Um, do you think that uh, the sentiment is changing towards the French? Are, are they diminishing as a military power? And which other powers might uh, come in to fill that void? Do you think Russia, China could, could be playing more of a regional role in Africa? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the two things you mustn't forget about, about the, the, the French. The first was... Uh, why France is so engaged with Africa. And it really goes back to the Second World War. Don't forget that it was Chad that was the first country in, in, in the Second World War that went over to Charles de Gaulle. And de Gaulle never forgot that and believed that he, the way forward to repay the debt that he had to them was to integrate um, Africa into the French system so you could become a full citizen 
I mean, you did have to pass, uh, you know, tests of wealth, education, all the rest of it, but you could become a genuine French citizen and you were received at the Elysee and with, with all these, the, the pomp you can, you can imagine. And uh, it worked quite well. They ran the, the currencies, um, they put their troops in and when, when uh, governments were in difficulties, they, they propped them up. Uh, of course, sometimes against their own citizens. But so it, was, it, it, it worked for a while. It's kind of run out of steam now. And um, Macron has, uh, I think, said, you know, enough is enough. And he is really uh, seems to be pulling out of there. And as you, you're quite right to say that this leaves the way open for others. Now, the others tend to at the moment have been the, the Russians, particularly, and the, the Americans. Now, the, the, the Americans go informally. They have um, uh, with Africa, Africa Command, Africom, uh, which uh, is based in Stuttgart and, uh, you know, is, you know, operates across the whole of Africa, has done, done loads of training uh, with, with African uh, troops. And, uh, you know, sometimes they are seen as a good thing, sometimes they're not seen as a good thing. Um, so th they are involved. The, the other people are the, not the Russians directly, but the Wagner Group, who are Russian mercenaries, you pay them, uh, they are, you know, tough bastards, they go in, they're in places like Mali, they're in Libya, and, uh, you know, you, you just, they, they will come in and, and do what the president wants. I think there's one other group that you need to, to think about, which is that the, the Israelis have been very involved too, not directly with troops, uh, but through technology. And that is with the, uh, the software that they, they sell to all sorts of African governments when they, they are running or thinking of running an election um, to put out all sorts of propaganda. They can eavesdrops in the opposition. They, they use this very complicated um, so, uh, software which will allow people to know what's, get, what's on your mobile phone, even if it's switched off. And it's in places like Kenya, it's been used, Rwanda, so there are all sorts of ways in which there are still interventions. I mean, the British have some act, act, uh, role in Africa, but it's, it's a pretty minor one, mostly in places like Kenya. Uh, although they do, they do keep an eye on, on what is going on. So there is an outside role, but at the end of the day, Africa mostly runs itself for good and ill. So Martin, you have been quite involved uh, in studying the conflicts in the Horn of Africa. Uh, you've written a book about Eritrea, and you've done a lot of journalistic coverage of the situation in Ethiopia. I think Ethiopia is a really interesting country because uh, a couple of years ago, it was kind of the darling of the World Economic Forum. Uh, it was seen as being on an upward trajectory. And in terms of development theory, it was kind of held up as this model of, well, you can have a fairly authoritarian system uh, and still have very high levels of economic growth. Uh, but one of the criticisms I've always had of that is that, well, these systems are a lot less stable than you think they are. Uh, it's very much concentrated power in the hands of, of an elite or a, a very powerful president. Uh, but as soon as that power starts to uh, be shaken by some kind of endogenous or exogenous factor, then the whole thing kind of crumbles. What is your assessment, given that you have a lot of experience and have studied the, the region? What is really kind of happening there? The whole of the Horn of Africa is absolutely fascinating area and uh, in some ways quite unlike the rest of, uh, of sub-Saharan Africa in as much as it had a, a written language and uh, therefore it can trace its history back hundreds and hundreds of years back through all its emperors and, uh, you know, the, and what was going on the fighting between the various groups of which there have of course been many. Um, I mean, the, the, the real problem with, with Ethiopia, um, in a sense, stems from exactly the same problem that happened in, what was it, 1884, 1885, with the Conference of Berlin, where European powers chopped up Africa. Well, uh, Emperor Menelik saw this as great opportunity to seize vast quantities of the south and the east of the country, including um, the Somali regions, the Oromo regions, and the many, many uh, other, I mean, there are eight, over 80 uh, ethnic groups in, in, uh, in Ethiopia. And he, he, he expanded this enormously, but of course then it was no longer the uh, sort of highland Christian um, country that it had been and became, uh, you know, predominantly, if you look at the terms of the actual land mass, a lowland and um, Muslim country. 
uh, and the tensions that that ratcheted up, um, in a sense, is what we, we see played out from that day to this. Um, and so there's a very fundamental issue there about how do you bring together a country that is so diverse uh, without it being just dominated at the, from the center. Uh, and it always used to be dominated by the, the Amhara or the Tigrayans. Uh, they were the two highland Christian communities. They sort of fought each other, swapped power um, down, the, down the years. And sometimes the emperor came from one group, some, sometimes from the other. Um, but of course, the, the vast majority of the population weren't included. So the Oromo, for example, who are about a third of the population, maybe more, um, the first time they ever held power. And so uh, Prime Minister Abbey comes to power in 2018, and he was of Amhara and Oromo lineage. And that meant that uh, the, the Oromo could say, we have somebody in power. But I'm afraid, he, you know, the way he's ruled has not been necessarily in favor of the Oromo. Um, and uh, the, the war that, that there now exists in the north of the country against the Tigrayans, which brings in the Eritreans and the Somalis, um, has, is, is, is the worst in the world at the moment. I mean, nobody knows how many have died, but at least 100,000 probably. And uh, there are five, six million people who are surrounded by and, and, and being strangled by a blockade. And children and the elderly are dying. So, and the Tigrayans were, they used to be a lot more powerful and were kind of associated with more of the, the older regime. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they came to power in 1991 when they overthrow uh, the military regime, which had been running the country, uh, which was called the Derg, uh, and Mengistu, who was the leader, then flees to Zimbabwe. And they take power in 1991, and they hold it until 2018 when Abiy, uh, takes over from them, they essentially pushed out and uh, they disappeared back into the into the, the northern hills, mountains, and uh, it looked as if they were just going to sort of exist as a semi-autonomous area. But uh, both the Eritreans and Abbey decided this was not acceptable and they, they essentially launched this war against them. Yeah, and I think uh, what's very interesting about Ethiopia is that, I mean, you mentioned the Berlin Conference in 1885, but uh, to many... In many respects, it was a kind of spared the ravages of colonialism. There was the Italian invasion of Abyssinia. Um, but you know, many countries, perhaps in West Africa, you could point to the legacy of slavery uh, as, as leaving kind of deep scars on those countries. Uh, but Ethiopia was a, a bit different. And I think uh, what's also interesting about Ethiopia is this tension between the different ethnic groups. And, you know, I think... Uh, this highly centralized state model, this authoritarian model that's kind of imposed there is perhaps uh, not dynamic enough. It's not flexible enough to the needs of local communities, local groups, however they might uh, want to define themselves. Um, so do you think that there's a case to be made for a much more decentralization in Ethiopia? And you know, if the Tigrayans want to go live in their semi-autonomous region, then kind of let them do that. Or do you think that that might spiral into some kind of kind of ethnic balkanization where uh, you, you just have this complete fragmentation of, of countries and, and, and a lot of instability ensuing? I mean, l let me just get onto that in one minute. Of course, you, what, what, the one thing you, you're, you're forgetting in contrasting West Africa with East Africa is that East African slavery was longer than West African slavery and as numerous. And the, the enslavement of Africans from all the way from Mozambique right up to Ethiopia by um, Arabs and by Indians went on uh, for much longer than West African slavery. In fact, they were, the, the last slaves in, in the Gulf were released in the 1960s. Uh, and, you know, people forget East African slavery completely and sort of it, it's blocked out of their minds. But it is the oldest slavery in Africa. And the, uh, and the one that they endured for the longest. Um, on the question of the, um, the balkanization of Ethiopia, I mean, that is a, a real question and nobody knows how to do it. There are in essence two ways you can run Ethiopia. And that is, this is what the, the whole war is about. There is, as you said, the old imperial system, which Abbey is in a sense trying to reintroduce, which is a centralized system 
where you give some power to, to regions, but essentially you run it from the center. And what the Tigrayans tried to do was to say, no, look, everybody has, they went for what was called ethnic federalism, where each ethnic group, although they didn't have 80 uh, states, they had, um, I think it was 11 different regions, um, you know, had uh, the right to, uh, uh, similar to the old Stalinist um, uh, constitution, which said that you have the right to, exec to exercise your own power up to and including independence if you ask for it. There's always a subtext, if you ask for it, we'll come and kill you. But I mean, you know, let's leave that aside. Um, and they, they tried to decentralize power, but then behind the scenes, they then created ethnic parties, which they, the Tigrayans then ran because they didn't fancy what they'd actually agreed to. So you can see, yes, there is the idea of, of ethnic, ethnic federalism, but really it was, it was still controlled from the center because it is, it is very difficult to give up, give up power. But you know, I think that um, there is an, another issue all we, everything that we've concentrated on so far relates to the immediate or what goes back, uh, you know, shall we say to the colonial period. But I think that there is, if you really want to understand why it is that most of sub-Saharan Africa is so um, endemically in, unstable, you have to go back much further. And so to the pre-colonial period. Exactly. And because if what, you, what were some of the events or... or... Well, or movements Just of history. Ask yourself what most of Africa, most of Africa, and this is not true for everywhere, it's certainly not true for parts of Ethiopia, it's not true for North Africa, and there are, are parts of West Africa where it doesn't apply to, but let's say in most of, of, of Africa is, a, 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 is a, 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 a continent of villages, dispersed populations, small populations who, you know, didn't really trade with the outside world. And there were specific reasons for that. I mean, unlike, shall we say, the, uh, the European or the Asiatic rivers, where you can trade, you can flow, you can, you know, sail all the way down them. You can't go up the places, the Congo and the uh, Limpopo. You, you end very rapidly in, in rapids. So you can't go inside. They're, they're patterns of um, sickness, of uh, disease, and poor soils, which are fragile, which meant that frankly, people moved between areas over a lengthy period of time. And the, and the um, you know, while for example, the, the, there's evidence now that people lived in Southern Africa for tens of thousands of years, there was also a long migration of the Bantu people from Central Africa, which was always portrayed by the, the uh, you know, the Afrikaners and the, the, the apartheid system as being, oh, it was an empty land and they, they, we all arrived at the same time, which is completely untrue. But there was a, a shift in, in people. And the, what, the way that people survived in this, um, shall we say, decentralized, small population, um, simple technology uh, system was by kinship. You might have a famine or, or face a terrible flood or a fire one year, but somebody, shall we say, 30, perhaps 50, maybe 100 miles away was related to you by kinship and you could go and ask them. It was your insurance policy. Now, of course, that kind of thing happens everywhere. But when, if you then, that formed deep, deep roots in African culture and you, you know, everyone, everywhere you go in Africa, you people talk about their families, their kinship, their ethnicity. Now, of course, people talk about kinship and family everywhere in the world, but in, you know, I spent a year in, in India and the contrast is so sharp where, of course, people are, uh, relate to their kinship, but they found other ways of, of living. And I mean, if you take, for example, a comparison, say, between Brits arriving in, say, Malawi and, and in, in India, when they arrived in India, there were whole systems of manufacturing that had been established. There was a whole civil service. There was a, uh, you know, uh, there were systems of writing and which went back hundreds of years. When the Brits arrived in, in, uh, in uh, Malawi or Zambia or some of the other, uh, other countries, what was there? You know, there were people in villages and they then brought everything that, that uh, was going to create a modern economy in the, in the, uh, it, with colonialism. So it's a completely different relationship. When, when then the 
politicians come to power in Africa, and don't forget the whole colonial period is what, 60, 70, 80 years long. It was quite a short period. They brought with them this relationship with kinship and they, when they came to power, they had, they were, they had the biggest problem was that they had no experience of running a complex society. Most of them were priests or small scale farmers, maybe a small scale, um, uh, you, know, you know, producer, but nothing, nothing major. And, uh, and of course, politicians. And they didn't have any experience of complex societies. While as the Indians, when they came to power, they had had you know, hundreds of years. They just had to go back to running themselves, which they always had been doing. Same you could say of the Chinese. And so you get these people coming to power with huge demands of kinship on their resources and just about zero ability to fulfill the um, demands or the requests of their kin, you know, who came from 50 miles, 100 miles away, just as they had used, you always did in the past when there was a crisis. And you can, you can come and say, you're my uncle, you're my great grandfather or whatever it is. And you can ask for a job. And so that is why you get this relationship which goes back then to ethnicity, kinship, and you provide for your family writ large. While as in, in, you know, in places like, like India, of course that happens, but it's very different. And you know, there's there's much more of a of a manufacturing base which is established, and you get you get you know great um, you know manufacturing dynasties and and uh, you know agricultural dynasties in in the Indian subcontinent, which are very difficult to find. I'm not saying they don't exist in Africa, and in Africa they are now beginning to uh, emerge, but at independence they, they did not really exist. And that meant that people went back into kinship. They, they, they found that they had a little pot of wealth. They held on to it for dear life through the power of the gun and they distributed what they had. And that is the system that has existed. And you can see obvious um, parallels in South Africa where Zuma basically favors his family, family writ large. And uh, you know, everyone else can go to hell. Um, I mean, to put it bluntly. Yeah, if I cast my mind back to some of my political science courses looking at African politics and this term neo-patrimonialism, I think was what was used, uh, that you know, basically using uh, you know, tribe and kinship as this kind of vehicle for patronage distribution. But then I think there's also this really important point that you make that uh, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric around decolonization, but one of the legacies of the colonial period was this very idea of the nation state that was kind of superimposed on what was a very different society. If you consider how emergent the nation states were in Europe, you know, periods of fluctuating borders, oscillating power. Um, and, you know, if you look at all of those straight line borders in Africa, those are these kind of artificial creations. And it's no surprise that this creates all sorts of tensions and conflicts um, particularly when you kind of overlay this uh, kind of ethnic dimension to it. Absolutely. But, 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 you know, let's not forget that, you know, just compare it with Britain, where you have uh, complicated borders, which have been people have been arguing about for centuries. There's still no uh, stability. I mean, you know, is Ireland going to be reunited? Are the Scots going to become independent? Does what Welsh want independence? Nobody knows. And maybe that will happen. But you know, quite frankly, the vast majority of the people, it doesn't make much difference to, uh, they'll go on living as, as they do. But I mean, just to go back to your original question about coups, um, and you know, to sort of where we, we started this discussion. You know, I was in um, Kampala in 1986, when uh, shortly after um, Yoweri Museveni marched into Uganda, in, into the capital of Uganda, after an appalling system of, uh, of corruption and death and murder with under a boat and uh, under a mean. I mean, you know, vast numbers of people died. But what was it really all about? Well, first of all, the, 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 what it really was about was that the northerners who'd run the country since the uh, the end of of of, the, of colonialism and British rule had, for the last time, were losing power. They had run the army. And the, and the people in the south and the center of the country had run the civil service. And frankly, the army had 
just taken over uh, after independence and ran the place for them. And it was the, the people in the south and the center learning how to fight and they fought and they took back the country. But the north has been absolutely uh, you know, decimated as a result of that and gets nothing. And if you remember the Lord's Resistance Army, which was a, the most murderous um, of the, uh, you know, sort of you know, semi-evangelical terrorist groups who, you know, cut off people's ears, lips, and God knows what, and it were eventually vanquished with American help, and driven into, into uh, Chad. Um, I mean, that was the result. It was the despair of the North. That, that that came about, um, but you know, if you if you you know if you look at coups, I mean, you could argue that Museveni came to power in a coup in in a, in ninety six, sorry, in eighty six. He then holds an election ten years later. That's the that's the model. So you have the coup. Everybody says that's terrible. You then have the election when you've got it ready, and uh, you then in power and hey, you're a democratic, uh, you're or, or, all of a sudden a Democrat. And that is what most African leaders who take power would now like to follow that kind of model. Coup, gap, election, probably rigged. You're in power as a Democrat all of a sudden and you can be at the top table, you're at the African Union, you're at the Commonwealth Summit, you're at the French, you receive the Elysee Palace and what's not to like. And elections are an indispensable part of democracy, but uh, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for democracy to flourish. You also need the rule of law. You need independent institutions holding uh, the powerful to account and, uh, you know, also a regular exchange of power. But, I mean, let me ask you on, the, on uh, you know, you talk about the regular exchange of power. Would you call South Africa a democracy? Uh, I mean, in, I'm 71. In my lifetime, there have only been two governments that have ever been in power. There was the Nationalist Party, which came to power two years before I was born, and there was the ANC. And that's it. Now, is that a satisfactory democracy? There has been no exchange of power between competing things. Now, maybe things are now falling apart, and it's very messy, I know, in South Africa. I mean, I couldn't possibly name for you who runs which bit of, of, of South Africa, and I don't know, could, I'm not even sure, could you? Uh, <laughs> it's you know, but at least things are moving. But where will where will this leave the the, the elite around um, around Zuma and the Guptas and all the rest of it? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. So Martin, I actually studied single party dominant systems in my master's thesis, uh, where I actually looked at the example of the Indian National Congress in India, and I was very interested in how dominant parties decline. And, you know, I think what, what happened there is very instructive. I think, obviously, very different uh, social and political context in India to South Africa. But I think what happened there is we had this uh, dominant party that had this very sophisticated uh, way of uh, distributing power and uh, shoring up the support of local uh, big men, if you will. Um, but once that system started to be ever more centralized, that uh, network of, of patronage and, and the distribution of power started to break down. Um, and I think something similar is happening in South Africa that for a long time, the ANC was the only game in town. Um, and it was an essential way for you to get access to positions of power or uh, to uh, get uh, wealth or resources. Um, but I think that that system is taking major strain. And yeah, at the electoral level, we're certainly seeing uh, the ANC now dipped below 50% for the first time. It's now 46% on the, if you aggregate all of the local government election results. Um, so we could be seeing that um, in the next election. Uh, and obviously, uh, there are other mechanisms of democratic institutions, uh, but they're a little bit under strain at the moment um, and uh, are not as robust as they were, say, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so I think the picture is very mixed when it comes to South African democracy. Um, and I think it's a question of degree rather than a, a kind of a binary question of is South Africa democracy or not? I think it's it's a messy, chaotic system with democratic features. Um, and I think a vibrant culture of, of free expression and challenging the incumbents in power. Um, but I think very high degrees of transparency 
but very low degrees of accountability. So I think that's a good way of kind of thinking about where South Africa is at the moment. Now, I just raised it because you, you know, you talked about an, uh, an exchange of power. And what mm. I was just pointing out was that we've only in, in, in 70 years, we've had one. Yeah. And that's the, I think the yeah, ultimate yeah. litmus test is, is, can you have a peaceful transfer of power? So yeah, many yeah, people... I mean, you compare it with somewhere like Ghana, for example, they have, you know, regular uh, elections where through really narrow, uh, you know, uh, majorities, hard fought elections and presidential power changes. And, you know, Ghana is a wonderful place. I mean, I mean may have problems, but, uh, you know, I, I certainly love the Ghanaian mm. system and I love the Ghanaian people. And competition produces better results. It means you have to come up with innovative policy ideas. You, uh, you, you've got to be careful about if you misstep or abuse the trust of the electorate, they could chuck you out uh, at the exactly. next election. That's the bottom line. So where do you think are some of the bright spots in Africa there, Martin? Uh, you mentioned Ghana. Um, I think... Uh, would you classify Cote d'Ivoire there as well? I mean, by no means a perfect country, but seems to be on a, an upward growth trajectory after some of the instability of about 10 years ago. I mean, all those kind of places are good, but, you, you know, they're 54. We could go through them all and sort of knock, knock off good, the good and the bad. Um, and I mean, as you say, they go for everything from a place like Eritrea, where, which I know, I know quite well, where there the has since independence... Uh, in 93, there has never been an election. There is no uh, uh, parliament, there is no um, constitution. The, the country is run by President Isaias and his mates, and it's as simple as that. And then, you, as I say, you go through to somewhere like Ghana, where you know, there's, there's a, a fierce contestation for power, which is, which is admirable. Um, you know, that's Africa for you. Everything you, can, everything you can imagine, and certainly one of the... Uh, most vibrant and uh, one of the things that the one of the reasons I've always loved Africa is because wherever you go, uh, unlike Eastern Europe, um, people think that their their country and their continent is the best place in the world, and they love it. And you only have to look at African football to see the passion with which people uh, adore their country, adore their continent, and think they are they that things are going going to go going to go well, even if they may not be going well now. And that's why I've always enjoyed Africa. And I'm, I just love Africa. And I, I, I've worked well with Africans my whole working life. And that, for me, is the bottom line. It's a great place. And in due course, I'm sure these, 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 these things will be left behind. But that's a hard road to follow. Yeah, and I think a good way to think about Africa is, is trying not to project your own image of what you think Africa ought to be. But try and assess Africa for what it is. Um, Absolutely. And then I think yeah, actually you come away with a deeper appreciation for it. I completely agree. You know, it's just, it's, uh, I've, I've, I've never, I'm, I'm never happier than when I when I've got the dust of Africa between my toes and in my hair. It's a, uh, it's a brilliant place, and um, you know, for all the problems, it's, it's somewhere I, 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 I will be part of me for the rest of my life. Yeah, and if you consider how many parts of the world under the COVID pandemic really uh, suffered under the kind of heavy uh, restrictions of government action, uh, the actual uh, mortality effects were a lot higher in, in other parts of the world. Africa was actually a pretty good place to be during the pandemic, I think. Absolutely, I agree. Um, so just getting back to, to politics, uh, Martin, and you know, I, my uh, girlfriend is, is Kenyan and uh, she's a Luya speaker. Uh, so I want to ask you a little bit about, about Kenya, because I have a particular interest there. Um, you know, I think there have been some disappointments there. I mean, it's certainly a robust, very competitive uh, system, um, but, you know, massive problems with, with corruption, uh, also uh, not honoring the results of elections. Uh, where do you think Kenya is going? Because at some point it was looking like an emergent, nascent tech hub. Uh, the uh, kind of Silicon Savannah concept was thrown around. Um, and there certainly seems to be a lot of entrepreneurialism. And uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, maybe Kenyans are perhaps more dynamic than their political class. Um, and they kind of achieve great things in spite of uh, their political leaders. Do you think that that's a, a fair assessment? No, I, I completely agree. I mean, the, uh, and, you know, they, they've, you know, there's the, the, the huge, uh, you know, 
problems between the various ethnic groups uh, for, for the reason we've discussed um, and, you know, between the people of the Rift Valley and the people of the, uh, you know, the more coastal area, uh, it's, it's very complicated. And, um, and there are all sorts of things you're not ready for. I mean, for, I don't know if you remember Darren, Daniel Arab Moy, who was, uh, he was actually brought in because he was seen as uh, representing a, a very small ethnic group, that he was um, a pretty useless, uh, just a bureaucrat who wouldn't, wouldn't last. <sighs> he was there for ever and a day. And, uh, you know, he, he manipulated everybody else instead. So once you become the president, of course, you, you, can, uh, you can run almost anything. And, uh, you know, the Kenyatta family has been <laughs> pretty good at that for a very, very long time. And, um, uh, you know, they've they are past masters at, at running elections, rigging if necessary, stoking up the violence when um, when elections take place, and it's 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 really really sad. Um, but uh, you know the the Kenyan people, as you say, are are, are very dynamic, and uh, you know in in the Horn of Africa, they've played a remarkable role in trying to. Um, bring stability to places like Uganda, um, bring Somalia. stability to places like e Somalia, Ethiopia. I mean, they have troops in, in, in the border area of Somalia, as you say. Uh, it's, it, and they are a, a bit of a hub of stability. But, you know, as you say, they go through these terrible convulsions every few years when they have an election, which the ruling elite is frankly not prepared to lose. And as I said, they will use the kind of Pegasus um, software that the Israelis are producing now could be used in all sorts of ways. So Martin, this is the solutions podcast. And, you know, I think one of the temptations that I try to resist is to kind of put on the table uh, silver bullet solutions or, or glib, uh, careless recommendations. Um, but, you know, if we had to think more holistically about uh, a more peaceful, conflict-free Africa, how do we get to that to that point? Because, you know, it seems that we kind of go through these routine cycles of relative stability and then chaos. Uh, and what can ordinary people in Africa or elsewhere who may be part of the diaspora have an interest in, in seeing a, a better, more peaceful Africa? What, what recommendations would you put forward, uh, not necessarily just to policymakers, but to ordinary people who are, care about the future of the continent? Well, first of all, I think one should not lose hope. Um, I think that's the, 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 the most important thing. Um, as I said, you know, the, the, all these, the, the problems that people are facing now are, are probably um, temporary, by which I mean, uh, you know, not, uh, probably won't endure more than a couple of lifetimes. But I mean, in, in terms of human history, that is, that is quite short. Um, you know, Europe went through three world wars, if you take the Franco-Prussian War first. Today, you know, people, you know, young French People walk across the border into Germany. They can't even be bothered to remember which country they're in. Uh, you know, so the, the deep, deep rifts which have emerged in other countries and nations can can be overcome in time. And the fact that you know that population growth is coming down, I think people hate talking about it because it's somehow seen as uh, uh, not politically correct. But I, I, I think it's really important because it means you can focus on your on growing your wealth in a smaller family, getting that, getting them going. The education, uh, I mean, there's so many more young women that are now in, in education in Africa. And, you know, that, that is such a resource. And I think the, the, the final thing that I would point to is the massive contribution that the, the uh, African diaspora pay, plays to their con the continent. I think it was in Sudan they they calculated it was either two or three times the amount of money comes from uh, the diaspora as comes from the the aid agencies, the IMF and the World Bank, and they that that money goes directly into into the pockets of the, your auntie, mother, grandchild, or whatever it is, and you know the, the, there's next to no corruption. If there was one thing I would ask the West to do it would be to reduce the transactional costs of that money transfer. Uh, if that could be made cheaper so that people can actually get the money into remote locations, 
more cheaply than they can now, either by Western Union or the Havala system, which uh, you, you probably know from, from Kenya, um, which the, these are expensive systems, allow the transfers to take place. Um, those are really important ways of getting money into, into communities in ways that they can mobilize it themselves. And, um, you know, plus, of course, the other thing that, that gives me optimism is that the, uh, the um, I, I met a fantastic young uh, Ghanaian who had come back from, he'd been, had a job at Salomon Brothers in, in the States, you know, one of the big um, banking finance corporations. And he went back to, 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 uh, to Ghana because he thought he could do better than the squillion dollar um, salary that he was doing there in his own country. And he founded his own bank and he's done fantastically well now has branches across West Africa. So, and, and these people don't give a damn about politics. They think that, you know, they'll deal with the politicians if they have to, while it's their, the, you know, the, their parents or grandparents' generation thought politics was the only way of getting on. And I think that that is really a helpful way of looking. I mean, how many young um, South Africans are there now who are well qualified, um, you know, and capable of being really excellent, um, you know, businessmen and women can run farms. And the, the color of their skin is neither here nor there. I don't give a damn what, what somebody's skin color is. Um, you know, and that's what you want. You want people who would get up and who are get up and go and make two blades of grass grow where one grew before. Yeah, and a few years ago, I read Dambisa Moyo's Dead Aid, uh, which I think highlighted some of the limitations of of just throwing money from the West at, at African problems. And often that's used to prop up uh, uh, corrupt dictators like we saw with Meles Zanawi in, in Ethiopia. Um, and I'm also yeah quite optimistic and quite bullish about some of these technological changes. Uh, I think remittances play a huge role and it's probably underestimated in some of these discussions. Uh, but I would also say that the ability of people who want to support in a charitable way causes in Africa, direct giving uh, mechanisms now exist. Um, and even just uh, having a mobile phone gives you access to markets uh, for your goods, for your agricultural products, uh, gives you insights into the weather, for example. Um, you know, I don't think these things are a cure-all. I'm not kind of a technological utopian, but I think there are tools that are going to help uh, ordinary Africans to, to uplift themselves. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't think waiting for politicians to, to uplift you is, is a very good strategy. I think you need to get on and, and make your own future. I agree. Well, Martin, I just wanted to thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. This was a wonderful discussion. And I think uh, for anyone who has an interest and a passion for Africa, as you clearly do, I think this was a fascinating conversation. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Nice to be with you. If you enjoyed this discussion and you're watching on YouTube, please give this video a like. That really helps with the algorithm. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel as well. And if you're listening on your preferred podcast platform, please do subscribe there as well. Quick reminder, I've started a weekly personal newsletter. So if you would like to get more thoughts and reflections on these episodes, as well as on what I'm reading, then you can click on the link in the description below and you will receive those newsletters every Saturday morning. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.